Well, hello, everyone, and welcome to the Digital Today's podcast. I am Dave. I'm Ron. And Ron, we get episode two, was it 219 today? 219, it's the Michael Jackson episode. Gary, Indiana, your home sweet home. He was, area code 219. He was, I thought he was from Detroit, or is that Kid Rock? Uh, the, well, a lot of the Motown singers were from there, but no, the Jacksons grew up in Gary, Indiana. Interesting. All five of them? All five of them. All six. Was there six? Janet. Oh. Janet wasn't part of the Jackson Five. Oh, that's right. That's right. She was um, She was the younger one that did good times. And, and oh, Latoya. Yeah. That's seven. Uh, Latoya makes it. Latoya oh, makes wow. Seven. So the Jackson Seven. Interesting. There's so, a lot of Jacksons. Uh, the, Jack, the Jackson Seven. So, yeah. So it's it's Gary, Indiana, and as Opie sang in um, The Music Man, My Home Sweet Home. Oh, nice, nice. Uh, ways to get a hold of us here, digitaltodice.com is the website. 978-751-DICE is the text line, digitaltodice at yahoo.com. And over on Facebook, facebook.com slash groups slash digitaltodice. Now, in this episode, 219, we're actually live on YouTube right now along with the podcast. And we have back on the show... Uh, Jay Thomas Hetrick. Now, he uh, did the Misfits, Baseball's Worst Team Ever book, and we talked a lot of Cleveland Spiders in 1899 baseball uh, a few months ago, and he's back now with a new book that we're going to talk about and a new tabletop baseball game that we're going to be yes. talking about tonight. Now, what I want to do is uh, I'm going to add this book to the stage here. Let me get my keyboard out of the way. And what I'd like you to do is talk a little bit about this book here. So it's Baseball Stats and Stories, Confessions of a Tabletop Simulation Gamer. And this book, as you can see, is pretty no big. reading there for our audio people. Yeah. So, so talk a little bit about what this book is. Okay, well, first of all, it's 574 pages. It's not for the meek, uh, not for the meek at heart. Um, it is about my history, my personal history of playing tabletop baseball. Uh, it discusses my early days as being a baseball fan going all the way back to 1967. That's, yes, that is 47 years ago. Oh, it's a little bit longer than that. 57. Okay, 50, 57. <laughs> whatever. Gosh, I'm older than I thought I was. Uh, I'd be okay with 47. I, you'll take 47 in a minute, won't you, Dave? I would. Well, I turned 29 the other day, you know, for the you know the 34th year in a row, something like that. So anyway, um, but it discusses the um, my burgeoning fandom as I was uh, learning the game. And then as I was learning the game, I couldn't get enough of uh, the uh, baseball period. So I decided to uh, take up this game called Catico All-Star Baseball. Everybody knows that game probably at this point. It's the the spinner game. Spinner, right. You have the little disc and you put the disc that have wedges that equate to various outcomes of batters and you put them in a little spinner, and you spin the, the, the spinner, and if it comes up a one, it's a home run. If it comes up a seven, I still remember that's a single. I think eight was a strikeout. I, I forget all the rest. It's been so long. But uh, that game uh, was the start of my interest in tabletop baseball. But it, it, the game left a lot to be desired. Even oh, though so what, what, what a, did you do when you landed on the line? Because that was a well, thing. I, you know, again, I, I I sort of fudged it as good as I could do. Um, I um, th- this game had all kinds of issues, um, which I didn't really realize at the time. It did not have pitcher ratings, and it didn't have team affiliations. You just had a a, a disc with a name on it. Mm-hmm. And I threw the disc in there. And then w- one day I decided, you know, I'm going to play like a season. I'm going to play a league of, of, of these players, except I needed to have a draft to put them on teams. Mm-hmm. So I created the names of the teams. I made up names of teams. Uh, and uh, there were six of them all together. And I, uh, I didn't really keep the records other than the one lost records. And a couple of years ago, I went out to my garage shed where I keep my, just my excess junk. And I saw boxes and boxes of these 
uh, score sheets that I had kept meticulously over the years, including the all-star baseball. And I went back and I compiled all the stats in a retro format, which you can see there. That's right. um, So there's stats and stats and stats, and there's also text that goes with each one of the seasons or the replays that I completed. Mm-hmm. And uh, that's what the book is about. So it tells the story chronologically of my burgeoning fandom uh, interest in the Washington Senators back in the day when I was a kid and the Pittsburgh Pirates and the two famous players that were my favorites, uh, Frank Howard, the late Frank Howard, who just passed away recently. Uh, And uh, of course, in my opinion, the greatest baseball player that ever donned a glove or, or picked up a bat and that is Roberto Clemente, a man of such extraordinary talent that, uh, you know, people say Mays or Aaron or Ruth or Cobb. Yeah, well, I'm taking Clemente because he did it all. He could do it all. I I saw today, and I did not know this, that Clemente is the only person in Major League history to hit a walk-off inside the park grand slam. Correct. That's I had correct. no I had no idea it had ever been done before. Yes. But 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 yeah. He did that very early in his career, as a matter of fact. Okay. He started in fifty five. He was drafted by the Dodgers and he came up and uh never played for the Dodgers. He signed with the Pirates and of course he played the next eighteen years all of his career with the with the Pirates. Mm-hmm. And if you can, if, if you're a really big fan of, of, of retro baseball and you can uh, get into YouTube, you must watch the 1971 World Series because he put on a show oh, of yeah. shows with his bat, with his glove, with his arm, with his legs. I mean, you name it, he beat the Orioles. Uh, you know, with with hands behind his back, it was unbelievable performance. He did it all, literally, and uh, they won that World Series by the skin of their teeth. Yeah, I watched that in utero. <laughs> <laughs> I was fourteen, so yeah. I watched it uh, with with tremendous interest. But anyway, I digress. Okay, so um, so in this book. We're going to find uh, a bunch of stats from all the different games that you played, right? Correct. It is the, it's the actual stats of the games that I played and compiled. M- many of them were compiled long before uh, or long after the games were played. So once I found all these score sheets and in notebooks, they were meticulously compiled even back then. I went and got them out. I don't know if you can see them behind me, but... Um, let me see if I can move my body here. You see the two uh, white uh, areas back there? Mm-hmm. Those two shelves. There's actually three shelves worth of those white uh, binders, and they are just full of score sheets. There's about 7,000. Uh, there's almost 8,000 of them there. And uh, each score sheet comes on its own piece of paper. And uh, if there were two games, you know, it comes on the, 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 the verso side of the paper. And um, that's what I did for uh, a couple of years. I compiled all the stats and then I retrofitted uh, stories and uh, my analysis of the game, the game format, the season uh, as it played out. Uh, the teams, team by team, I covered all of the teams and uh, uh, the stats. So that's how the book works, plus uh, all the no-hitters, all the exhibition games that I played, and all of the uh, the dele- delineation between the seasons, I called them seasons, or replay seasons. The replay indicates that I played the entire schedule of the league. The season just means that I cobbled together a bunch of teams, like sometimes historical teams, and uh, I had one league called the seven-team league, so I cobbled together some really good teams and some middle-of-the-road and some bad teams. I had a 20-team league. I had a six-team league. I had an 1878 National League, and I played various amounts of games with these these, uh, seasons, and then I discovered – 
what I considered to be at that time, the greatest tabletop game that I'd ever seen. And I still think very highly of it. It was called sports illustrated major league baseball. It had a brilliant design. It was all color coded. And, um, today it has, uh, it's been revamped as Don Brav baseball in a digital format only, as far as I know. And, uh, you can get different seasons and, uh, that was the first time I actually played a replay season mm-hmm. when a friend of mine who wasn't even a big baseball fan, we were vacationing, uh, you know, in a high school vacation uh, with his parents in Sarasota, Florida. And he said something to me that, that rocked my world. It just changed my entire attitude on baseball and tabletop in general. He says, why don't you just, why don't you just play all the games? And I said, what do you mean play all the games? Yeah, just play all the teams and all the games. So I, you know, I didn't have a calculator back then because it's 1973, I think it was. And um, I calculated, uh, you know, on paper that uh, the the National League and American League played 972 games apiece with 12-team leagues back in those days. That'll keep you out of trouble for a while, yeah. That's 1,800 and what, 1,944 games. Are you out of your mind, Bob? <laughs> Bob Carnes is his name. I'll give a shout out to Bob. And But yet Bob wanted me to somehow photocopy these charts, and they were only black and white, and they were pretty crappy photocopies. And he got them, and he started playing the games, and I thought to myself, well, I'm not going to let him play an entire season of games without me doing it. And then we can compare back and forth. Um, I was living in Punxsutawney at the time, going to high school uh, for a couple of years. Now I'm back here retired. And he was living in uh, Fairfax, Virginia. Mm -hmm. And we would call each other every week or so and compare our stats and our, uh, our uh, seasons as they were going along. And uh, it was really an amazing experience. And then we played, we played both the national league and the American League of 1971, the entire schedule. He played a World Series, I played a World Series, and the results are in that book. Not not his results, but my results are all right. in that book. So what was the idea behind creating a book of all the games that you've played and all your stats compiled? What was the idea behind creating a book? Well, the idea really was – it was – one of those, you know, weird things that, that happens when you start to get older, you start to take stock of your life and think of things like, well, I need to, you know, compile something that I really never did before. And I want to have a record of it. And then the more I started looking at the stats and compiling the stats, I thought, well, this doesn't make any sense just to have this without, well, what was I thinking at the time? Uh, how did this season go? What is my literary analysis of everything? So I included that post, uh, you know, a couple of years ago when I wrote mm-hmm. wrote it all down and then compiled it. And my first take on the book was it was close to 700 pages. So I had to figure out ways to kind of uh, parse it down and uh, make it a little more palatable. But the... Um, the book does contain all of those games in the book itself. There's 7,613 games documented, but right now I'm in the middle of the 1957 replay in the American league. And uh, I'm playing that with, excuse me, eighties baseball, a game that I designed. Uh, Have you, have you ever replayed the 1899 Cleveland spiders? I know you're quite familiar with them. I did replay them uh, in several games in a season, and the results are um, interesting. Okay. Uh, what, what's interesting about the results is they were so actually bad that when they when they made the 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 uh, the charts and the records the the codes that use that you use for the probabilities, right. They would have been they would have been lower than all of the all, all of the codes could make it. In other words, um, they were they were you know basement level, and because they were um, 
not able to get within the range of the uh, 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 of the badness of the team, they actually were more competitive <laughs> than they were scheduled to be. So I think I played 45 games with them, and, and they were 12 and 33, which is bad, but not historically bad. Right? Yeah, good you, for you them. 23, 25 wins when you did them in, in Stratomatic, Dave? I, I think when I played Stratomatic, they, they get two or three more wins Maybe four. Yeah, they might have got twenty four. Four. Yeah, they were really bad. So, um, but you know the 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 game that I was playing in, they you know they were actually better because they couldn't be lower than the actual right data showed. So there there was kind of a, a fault in. Um, it wasn't the game's fault. It was just the fact that these guys were so utterly bad. Uh, you know there was no computer or anything to go with that to, to, uh, comp- to compensate. Hmm. So they actually played better. And not only that, but there's a write up in the book about a game that they defeated the 1927 New York Yankees, which are generally acknowledged to be the greatest team of all time and uh, how they did it. And the, 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 the score, the box score, the score sheet of this game is is like one of my prized possessions it's like it's like you cannot believe is that in the book worst team in baseball history beat uh babe ruth yeah that's in the book it is they beat babe ruth they beat uh lou gehrig they beat uh tony lazari they beat earl coombs they beat bob musel this is you know the greatest lineup the murderers row lineup and they beat them and uh and they beat him in, in kind of a weird way, too, a, a very, very strange Oh, It would way. have to be, so yeah, because they couldn't win a fair fight. It had to be something crazy. Right, right exactly. They were, they were obviously undermanned, um, uh, you know, completely outgunned pitching-wise, fielding-wise, and batting-wise. But they did win a game. And, um, I yeah, the story of the 1899 Spiders, I think if you go into the – I think they're in the twenty team league, but I'm you know what I got a I got a copy of the book right here. I'll uh, I'll show you right where it is, and you can uh, take yeah, a look at yeah, it. Yeah, I'm just trying to see if I could see the recap of that game. That would be something to yeah, talk the about. Recap is in the team analysis. That that's where it's located. Um, page fifty three. Let me see if that is. That's crazy. Yeah, I mean, yeah, it is crazy, and it. I mean. Another part of the the book here was um, as I was growing up and playing these games in my room, you know, kid, being a kid, mm-hmm. and then in my high school years, what was happening was I would go into my room and I would close the door and I would, you know, just start screaming and yelling and acting like a crazed person. And my parents probably thought I was out of my mind, you know, so <laughs> because I was sort of semi broadcasting yep. the game. Um, uh, they're not in the the twenty team league. They might have been in the seven team league. Let me check that as well. Well, I do that. I, I broadcast the games all the time, no matter what sure. game it is. I sit and I broadcast yeah, it's it. And... Fun. It's just fun, and, and, and you're in your own little world when you do it. Um, you know, just for grins and giggles, while you look, a couple of years ago, I did um a, a quick sim and action PC of the sixty two Mets and the seventy five Reds. You know, two teams that kind of are on very different ends of that scale. And right. the Mets ended up winning forty games. Yeah, they beat them. You know, I would have thought that that would have been, you know, as as it was like the Mets were doing super, but they they won. Yeah, they held their own. Right. It's page one thirty seven, by the way, Dave. All righty, so let's go to page one thirty seven. The page it's the write up of the Cleveland Spiders, and it tells the story of the games that they won in the most astounding ways. Oh most yeah. Nothing else really matters about the 1899 Cleveland Spiders. I, <laughs> that's the best way to start that paragraph. <laughs> yeah. uh, the umpire called safe, and the Spiders, their fans, and seemingly all of Cleveland rejoiced in wild celebration. Yeah, they yes. shut out the 61 Yankees 2 to nothing on two occasions. Beat the 61, 61 Yankees. Yankees. Wow. So, um, but that's the thing about tabletop baseball. If you play enough games, crazy things happen. Right. And um, I played enough games where I've had 14 no hitters. 
and one perfect game. Can you guess who pitched the perfect game? It's a blast from the past. Was it? It wasn't D- Dallas Braden, was, was it? Because that may be the most. Un- this is not. In re- I'm talking about in my tabletop. Like, right, not, but not that probably was the most unlikely perfect game ever thrown. Was by Dallas yeah. Braden. I was going to say uh, Crazy Schmidt. Uh, well, no, <laughs> his- he was a guy who's a pretty darn good pitcher actually in his career. Never had a perfect game. I've had two no hitters. I've had one no hitter. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Clemens. Yeah. It was Clemens. I've been playing yeah, these yeah. games for 20 yeah. years, 25 years before I had my first no okay, hitter. You get one within two years. 529, Dave, if you want to look it up. All right. All right. So we'll... just looking it up. 529. Right, and so... it is a gentleman by the name of, it happened in 1971. Oh, really? Don Wilson. Oh, the Astros. Yes, Don Wilson of the Astros, who's a, a pretty fair hitter as well. He beat the uh, the Giants one to nothing. That was the only perfect game. And I've had one game where a guy pitched a no hitter and lost, and that was Andy Messersmith, who gave up one hit in the eleventh inning and lost, which is somewhat akin to Harvey Haddock's yeah. in real life pitched uh, a one hitter. And, 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 and gave up a hit in the 12th inning to Joe Adcock and lost a game for the Pirates way back in the day. He retired, I think, the most in one game in, in the history of, of, of Major League Baseball. Yeah. In a row. I think it was like 37, 38 in a row. Yeah, I think it's like he took it in the 13th, right? I think it was in the 12th, 13th. The 12th, yeah, it, it, yeah. Was, it was very, very late. It was after the 11th. Even. Which, anyway, uh, which, so player, uh, which player on this no-hitter list of yours surprised you the yeah. most? Surprised you the most? The worst pitcher, you mean? No, no, no. Which, which pitcher on, on this list of no-hitters that you that you played, which one surprised you the most out of all of them? It's like, wow, I'm surprised this guy got a no-hitter. You know, why don't you read the list? Because Let me can't. check because I'm not sure. So, um, uh, so your no hitters were B- Bill Hands yeah, okay. of the Chicago Cubs in 1970. It's Malvin Powell. Malvin of the Powell, 1937 Chicago American Giants, the last one on the list. Yeah, oh, Malvin the Leagues. It's Malvin just Powell. a terrible pitcher. As a matter of fact, that was his win for the year. <laughs> ah, no way! The entire is gonna do it. Do it right, you know. <laughs> And, and that was in the Negro Leagues. Um, yeah. I played in the, uh, the 1937 Negro Leagues, National and American. And absolutely fascinating things happened there with um, the Homestead Grays and the the greatest tabletop team I've ever played, the Kansas City Monarchs, who were literally unbeatable. They won 18 of their last 20, and they um, – uh, they were they were in a dead heat with the uh, the Cincinnati team going into the last three weeks or so of the season, and they just obliterated the opposition. Mm-hmm. Um, they, they just couldn't lose, and they're also the only team I had that that had a guy that pitched um, to a perfect record. Okay, a perfect one lost record. That was Henry McHenry. Was ten and zero. That's pretty good. Now they only played uh, fifty six games. I had to play an even amount of games, right? Um, because you know of, of the amount of teams in the league and the uh, you know the fact that they only played for a couple of months that year and and other years because of the economics, right? And they did a lot of barnstorming too. So a lot of barnstorming. But these are the games they played within the league. So I played I played fifty six in the um, American and sixty in the national because the national had. Uh, so I this, was this with your was this with your game or or what when it eighties baseball? So talk right. about what caused you to want to create your own game game engine. Obviously, you were talking well, about how much you love the Sports Illustrated. That story, baseball. Uh, that story is in the in the Sports Sim magazine. But basically, what happened was I was uh, in the Air Force in the early eighties. I was stationed in Japan. And as much as I love baseball and, uh, you know, where I was in the northern part of the the big island of Honshu, they didn't really televise, at least I didn't have a television uh, capable of seeing 
the Tokyo Giants. Right. That were on that were on constantly. They're they their their version of the New York Yankees, you know, the winning team. They had Sadaharu. Oh, 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 yeah. And anyway, um, they play a completely different brand of ball. They they bow and they, and they're very respectful. They don't throw bean balls. I mean, it's just an amazing thing. Um, and uh, <coughs> what happened was I I was kind of I was there for thirty months on my tour, and I I didn't really get a fill of Major League Baseball. And when I came back to the states in uh, March April of eighty three, I was just starved for the game. And I, I just couldn't get enough, so I just indulged in uh, uh, the Baltimore Orioles, which were the closest thing to Fort Meade, Maryland at the time. Right. I went to a few games there uh, at the uh, Memorial Stadium, uh, which I really liked. And uh, they ended up winning the pennant that year and the World Series. And But, but something was gnawing at me in 84. You know, I had played all these tabletop games, and I wanted to get back into playing games, and then I thought – you know what? I got a lot of stats. I've got a lot of knowledge. I've got a lot of probabilities and percentages rolling around in my head. Why don't I create my own game? So I started to design a game and uh, I used my friend, Bob Carnes. Uh, we played a lot of games together mm-hmm. to kind of tweak the engine to see how it was working. And I was compiling stats while I was doing that to make sure that you know, things were kind of on the up and up, you know, to make sure that the, the home run hitters were hitting home runs and the the power pitchers were getting strikeouts and so on and so on. And um, but I wanted I wanted something where I did not know if these were in other tabletop games. I never played Strat and I never played Atba at that time but I played a bunch of other games. So I decided because I was a big fan of the Orioles and I had seen Earl Weaver over many years Mm -hmm. and I had seen Billy Martin over many years, I thought, well, why doesn't a tabletop game, do they have ejections? Can you, can you kick dirt on the umpire and do all the things that Weaver was doing and Billy Martin was doing? Why not have an ejection? (laughs) Why not have a manager ejection? So I built that into the game. And then uh, about rainouts. Well, obviously, you don't get rainouts in the Astrodome back when they played in the Dome or in Seattle back when they played in the Dome. But so, but what would happen if you have, you know, ra- rain or weather impacts? Now, I know a lot of the other games do have that today. Mm-hmm. And then, of course, the, the number one thing that people, I guess, in the tabletop uh, hobby are interested in, in for baseball – is the left-right splits. Right. You had to have the left-right splits. I didn't have them originally in the original design, but I thought, you know what? I mean, Casey Stengel really came up with this whole idea of you got to have your left-handed batters are going to hit better against right-handed pitchers, and your right-handed batters are going to hit better against left-handed pitchers, and it's because of that one very split second that they can see the ball coming out of the hand. And what batters generally do, as I later found out, is the batters can can read the, the seams on the ball and they can judge the spin rotation. Right. Uh, and, and that's how the, the good hitters can really uh, do well. And the bad hitters, you know, they're just not as good at it. But the, the good hitters also, they think. They think about what the pitch is going to be high, low, inside, outside, and, uh, you know, knuckleball, curveball, fastball, slider, et cetera. And they, they can outguess the better, the better batters outguess the, the better pitchers. That's the way it works. It's as simple as that. Mm-hmm. And it, if you can put your bat on the ball solidly, like Ted Williams said, the hardest thing in sports is to hit a round ball with a round bat – Yep. If you can do that consistently and hit line drives, you can hit 300. You can be successful. And so I read James A. Dare's book, uh, The Physics of Baseball, and I started getting into this concept of, well, what makes a, a, you know, a, a player be successful, not successful? What about outfielders, the parabola of the fly and the, the type of calculations that go on in the head 
of a person to go catch a fly ball and run after one and the fielding techniques of infielders and all this, just a fascinating, fascinating book. Mm-hmm. And then we're talking about the physiology of the, of the uh, shoulder and the arm, you know, the, the greatest outlier in, in baseball history for that is Nolan Ryan because he pitched right. 27 years and he never had a major injury. I Which mean, is remarkable because he threw hard. Yeah. Yeah. He threw hard. And so I started to get into these kind of concepts and, and I obviously you can't put that on paper or in a game, but I started to think about these more and uh, that it just spurred on the idea that I wanted to create a game of my own. And then mm-hmm. once I started playing it, I really, you know, uh, I really liked it. And, uh, you know, I just kept playing it and playing it and tweaking it and tweaking it and uh, coordinating with my friend Bob and uh, played it with all kinds of people in the neighborhood. Mm-hmm. And then uh, last December or so, I decided – well, I'm, you know, I'm sitting up here in Pennsylvania. I'm retired. Why not monetize it? And actually, yeah. Dave Gardner was one of the guys that told me that that's probably a good idea. Go ahead and monetize it. And and so I did. So I now have the game is available on my website, um, which is pokelpress.com. It's www.po. C O L P R E S S dot com. Mm-hmm. And both the game and the book are available along with the other books I've written. Uh, and uh, it's because they were originally, uh, my other books were originally published by another company. There you go. Thank right. you. Dave. Thank you, Dave. Uh, and um, they, uh, they, they went out of print from the other company. So I went and acquired the rights. So now I have, I, I can sell all my own products. So what else have you written? You wrote the spiders book and the statistics books. What other books have you written? Well, I wrote a book on the, the most astounding owner in the history of major league baseball, Chris Vonder A ah, or Von D or Vonder a, depending on how you want to pronounce it. Uh, he was a German immigrant and he's the guy most responsible for beer in the ballpark oh. and Sunday baseball. Okay. Uh, this book put me in the in the Baseball Hall of Fame twice. I've been invited. Congratulations. Including a couple of years ago where I was uh, the guest speaker to talk about in a panel about Mr. Vonderas. And who did he, what team did he own? He owned the St. Louis Browns. I this thought- is the National League version of the St. Louis Browns. Oh, okay. And before that, he started a league called the American Association, which competed with the National League. Back in the 1880s, yes. Right, 80, 82 through 91 until they were absorbed into the National League. And uh, they eventually became the uh, St. Louis Cardinals. Okay. Interesting. So nice. let me see. Let me ask. I got some questions for you here. Um, uh what was the the of all the games that you've played and leave yours out of it just to be fair what what was the funnest game that you played you had the most fun with well there's no question in sports illustrated sports illustrated okay sports illustrated is it's so remarkably well designed and the color coding makes it so easy to play and understand where you have uh you know green is is going to be a hit of some kind Red is an out of some kind. Blue is a strikeout, and and the, the the way the charts are designed, they're they're designed on one sheet of uh, landscape paper. It's glossy, it's in color, it's beautiful, <laughs> and one side contains the batters, and the other flip side contains the pitcher records and the pitcher batting uh, records. And so, what you can do is. Um, you can put the the batting chart, the batting team chart down, and flip the uh, the opposing pitching team underneath it, and you can see both uh, both charts at the same time. I'm also a big fan of the chart mode rather than the player card mode, because with a chart you can see everything right there on one sheet of paper, and it, it's so much easier to navigate through and to work through. 
mm-hmm. rather than the you know the cards. With and I have nothing against the cards, but it's just that I I just find it a lot easier to uh, use a, a chart rather than a card. Flipping through cards. Okay. Were you not aware of Strat or Appa? As oh, I was aware. Yeah, I okay. was aware of them, but um, I had I had uh, started to play the Sports Illustrated game so so frequently <laughs> throughout my high school days, and keep uh, keep the records and and coordinate with my friend Bob in another mm-hmm. state, and um, so you know I, I really didn't give it a, a second thought. I I. I was a guy just like many, many people. I got the annual Street and Smith's Guide every year. I'd look at the back, and I'd look at all these ads for teams. That's how I found out about the uh, some of these other games, like Gil Hodges, uh, uh, Pennant Fever, and uh, Kenneth Hawes, Pennant Winner 2, and now Catico. I mean, that was in every uh, toy store out there. Right. And, uh so that that's kind of how it all it kind of how it all coalesced. What um what, what's your favorite season to play and why? Oh well, there's no question about that. I a couple of years ago I completed the 1908 uh, National and American League season. One of the greatest seasons ever. Yeah, yeah, it's considered the greatest, most competitive season because three teams in each league competed until the last few days of the season and uh, you know, within one game, one and a half games of each other, <laughs> you had two of the great superstars of the game at that time, Ty Cobb with the Tigers and uh, his counterpart with the Pirates, Honus Wagner. Uh, you know, I mean, if you, you talk about two just unbelievable athletes, these two fit the bill. You got Christy Mathewson, you got Frank Chance, Tinker to Evers to Chance on the Cubs. Um, you've, I mean, there's just so many great players, and and yet they didn't hit the ball out of the ballpark. They played what was called uh, in the, the dead ball era. They played for speed. They played for base running. You know, um, every base was important. And, uh, you know, extra base hits were at a premium. and But the pitching was so unbelievable. The earned run averages for the league would be 220, 230. You know, so every run meant everything. And the games, because of the way they played, um, the one-run games, the two-run games, there were always tight games. And the season, even though it wasn't as competitive as it was in real life, uh, Cobb and Wagner did win the batting titles. Wagner ended up winning the triple crown, even though it wasn't, there wasn't such a thing at the time, but he won the triple crown for my tabletop. And uh, that was a total of 1,239 games, 616 apiece per, per league. And then the seven game world series between the Tigers and the Cubs as, as they were in real life, um, in real life, the, the Cubs beat the uh, the Tigers in five games. It took seven games for the Cubs to beat the Tigers, and then only on an error in the late innings by Germany Schaefer. Oof. Led the league in errors that year in tabletop with 60, and it, it just so happened that he made the, the, the critical bobble in the late innings to uh, help push Chicago. And they were down three games to one, too, by the way. They bought him a glove for 19-9, right? <laughs> they bought him a glove for 19-9, right? <laughs> yeah, exactly. And it was just such – it was so exciting. I thought I was going to lose my mind. I, you know, And, and the, the thing about this particular uh, concept or this game um, is that I decided that when it comes to the postseason, and I, I will adhere to this from now on, when you play a postseason, play one game a day. Just play one. That's what I do. All the stats, you know, put them all in your spreadsheet or in your word, you know, process or whatever you whatever you do. Play one game a day. Get those pitching rotations set up for game two, game three, game four. And you cannot believe the excitement level that will be built in because if you're like I am, you go to sleep and you're thinking, okay, the Tigers got game one, like 10 to 2 or something. 
they, they blew the Cubs off the field. How are the Cubs going to come back? And then it was three to one. And I'm going to sleep every night going, oh, my gosh, what's going to happen in game five? What's going to happen in game six? And so all of that stuff, the, the, the narrative analysis is in the book as well mm-hmm. for all of the postseason games. And I would highly recommend if you play postseason games, play one game a day. And, and just drag it out. And the drama is just so, so special. Yeah, that's interesting. Cause I, I know I, I've yeah. played games here and I've gone to bed and I've been up all night like, wow, that was unbelievable. And that, this, and that, and the yeah. other thing. And, you know, I, I played a, uh, I think it was a football game the other night. And one of my favorite teams won on a last second field goal. And it just was, it was fun. It was like, oh my gosh, I'm, I'm in bed going, I can't believe I drove down and kicked that field goal to win the game. And it's just, yeah, so some of the stuff we play here. And I think that's the the magic of tabletop games is that you're you're in there rolling dice, touching charts, touching cards. Yes. You're controlling everything and you're really yeah. involved in it and it's very yeah. personal it's very personal yes and that is exactly what i talk about in the book in the in some of the chapters of how the game uh depending on you know the seriousness you put into it you get the emotional uh, emotional bang for the buck when you uh you know you put so much into it and then um you know you you can't go wrong it's just it, you know if you're going to do this, you might as well go all in. Mm-hmm. And that's the way I've kind of approached it. Now, uh, in the early seasons that I played, uh, I'm, I'm highly critical of myself, of, of how I didn't really know what I was doing so much of the time. You know, I would screw up. I, uh, I would screw up lineups or, you know, I'd have two short stops in or some, some other ridiculous right. thing. And, and then, um, you know, as time went on, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm fixing all those problems. And is, there, oh, is there one player? I mean, I'm, this question is kind of for your lifetime and not necessarily from, cause I know you love the, the, the older seasons, but yeah. one, one player that when you look back at it after playing their season or whatever, that you might've seen play, that you got a better appreciation for because you were able to take, you know, one day at a time or one series at a time with that player that you, that you might've missed at 13, 14, 15 years old. Well, that one player, uh, because I didn't grow up with him, even though he, he was active when I, when I was a kid, right. I wasn't a fan really at the time. And he was very old and creaky and a guy that I have the, utmost respect for and uh, a man who um, who's had so many books written about him and he's written, you know, ghost had ghost written books about him as well. And that's Mickey Mantle. Okay. Just the most outrageously talented talented you've ever seen. I mean, you know, this guy could hit him out of every ballpark, including Yellowstone and the book that, that I must tell you about is called The Last Boy. And it's written by Jane Levy. Yeah, and I've, I've read her Colfax Jane book. Levy. Exactly. It is a sensational warts and all study of Mickey Mantle. And she was a big Mickey Mantle fan growing up. And, uh, you know, she met him. And, you know, she, she, she pulls no punches. And, uh, I mean, warts and all, like I'm, like I'm saying, uh, his his addiction, you know, his addictions to alcohol uh, are covered in in at great length, and it's just sad. It's just a sad, tragic story of how many injuries this man had. Well, I'm currently seeing what he can do in the 1957 replay because that mm-hmm. particular year he was the batting champion. No, no, he was the 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 MVP of the league, I believe. Williams won the batting title. But Mantle hit 365, and I mean, he's just a dynamo. He's just incredible, and uh, <laughs> he's just an extraordinary athlete who 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 did so many things despite the fact that he was a walking mash unit most of his career oh, from his rookie year. Yeah, and he, you know, and it happened. It happened the first, uh, I think, his rookie year in 19. 
I think it was 1951 yes. when he was playing in the World Series in Yankee Stadium and he got his cleats caught in a drainage uh, thing back in those days. Didn't have the, be- the best drainage. He got his feet caught. He twisted his leg up something awful. He was and- in right. He was in right field because DiMaggio wouldn't move. So he's in the he's in the World Series. He's playing in a position where he's not familiar with, and he trips over the drain. Yeah. Because DiMaggio played center, and Mantle's, Mantle's position was center right. for most of his career. Yep. And, uh, yeah, and it's it's so tragic that that was really the start, even though the man hit 535, 536 home runs. Right. Um, you know, but, but he's just the most incredibly tragic athlete. Uh, he is greatness personified. He would have been likely – the, the the record setter in every single category known. Oh sure. Uh, had he not been hurt his entire career, he oh, still was incredible. Own that World Series home run record forever. Yes, he did. He had eighteen for many many years. Nice. But you know, when when you when you do a lot of baseball research and reading, um, you come up with some really odd things. And I wanted to point out some really odd things. Some of the things are in the book, some are not. Um, one of the things that I heard about was a, a gentleman named Gabby Street. Anybody ever heard of him out there? Gabby Street, who was a catcher with the Washington Senators. Is this a story about the monument? Yes. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> Gabby Street is known as uh, he was called Gabby because he couldn't ever shut up. I think the name was given to him by by Walter Johnson. Anyway, and uh, Gabby Street was 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 very very uh, active with his with his uh, mouth, uh, constantly talking to the pitcher and what to do. And um, on a bet, he went uh, he went to the Washington monument, the monument had been completed at that time. It was 1908. It was actually in August. It was during the season. And um, he was told that they're going to drop a ball off the top of the monument to see if he could catch it. Well, my book says it took him 13 tries, but I actually went back to Sabre today and looked it up again. It was 15 tries. He caught the ball in the 15th try. Apparently, the ball weighed, you know, relatively, the pressure rised, uh, 300 pounds, and it, it was uh, 95 miles an hour coming wow. down wow. off the monument, which is the tallest building in Washington by law. It is 565 feet tall. So it, it, imagine that is not an easy play to make. Now he's in street clothes at the time he did it. And, and I just thought that's a really cool story that has not a whole lot to do with baseball with, with him playing games, but it's a, a really unusual story. And um, th- those are the kind of things that I intersperse in, inside the book. Mm-hmm. Can I tell one story about Frank Howard? Mm-hmm. Frank Howard um, in 2009 was invited to the Sabre Convention. For those of you out there that don't know what Sabre is, it's uh, Society for American Baseball Research. Uh, He was invited to their national convention in in 2009. Well, I'm at work in in Washington, D.C. at the time, actually, right across the street from American University in a place called the NAC, the Nebraska Avenue Complex. And I'm in this old Navy base, and, and I'm doing computer security, and I get this call from uh, from a guy at Sabre, <clears throat> who has since passed, unfortunately. And he says, uh, hey, uh, you want to call F- Frank Howard and invite him to the event, to our annual event? And I, I thought I was going to pee my pants. <laughs> you mean Frank Howard's number? I mean, I watched him as a kid. I watched him at home runs in the old D.C. stadium slash RFK stadium. And I'm going, oh, my gosh, I would, would I love to? Yeah. So he, uh, he gives me the number. I go to my boss and I say, you know, do you mind me doing something, making a phone call at lunch, on lunch uh, on my cell phone? He said, no, of course not. You do what you want on your lunchtime. 
on your lunch half hour. And I said, okay, great. So I, I had the number. I call Frank Howard. He answers the phone and I, I give him my spiel of how he's invited to DC to, to this national convention. And he keeps calling me Sonny boy. <laughs> well, I'm 52 years old at the time. I don't know if I was a Sonny boy at that point, but, uh, Anyway, so so Frank Howard, he's, he's just this uh, very, very gentlemanly guy. And um, so uh, it, it just it, it just turns out that um, I was a, a book publisher, still am. And I met this guy a few years earlier named uh, Steve Walker. And Steve Walker wrote a book about the 69 Washington senators. Yeah, we I, had him on. We, we actually interviewed him. Yes, yes. That, that's the same guy. And mm-hmm. um, Steve Walker, he just incredible guy. He in, interviewed a lot of the old senators. Uh, you know, Ted Williams was the manager of that team in his first year managing. And um, so I go to this particular uh, Saber event and I'm a vendor in the vendor room and I'm sitting next to Steve Walker and we've got a pile of a whole new ball game, which is the name of Mr. Walker's book. And of course I'm the author and um, uh, I'm not, I'm not the author. I'm sorry. I'm the publisher and Steve is the author and guess who walks in? You guessed it. Frank Howard. I mean, the guy's six foot seven. He looks like, you know, he's chiseled out of, you know, granite or something. He, he walks in and he's literally looking at the book where he's on the cover. I mean, it's the cover picture in color, batting, you know, and, and uh, he just looks at this and he looks at both of us and he says, Sonny boy, this looks like an interesting read. And we're like, we're like, our, our mouths are agape. We don't even know what to say at this point. We're, and, and, and Steve goes to him, well, Mr. Howard, we, we'd like to give you a copy of this book. And, but can we ask you first to autograph copies for us? We have a magic marker here for you, to, you know, a, a Sharpie to autograph the book. And he goes, oh, sure. No problem. So he autographs Steve's book. He autographs my book. And we're like over the moon. We don't know, you know, what to right. make. And the next thing he does, we say, you know, we'd like to present you with a copy of the book. We were going to give him one. And he said, oh, no, I can't take that. And we're, we're like looking at each other like, what do you mean you can't? He goes, give that to someone more deserving. What? <laughs> Yeah, great More story. Than you, you're the cover story. You're the, along with Ted Williams, you're the key player in the book. For crying out loud, more deserving. So the next person that came by, a, a young man with his father, probably about eight or nine years old. I said, "There's a gentleman that just walked in and walked out of here before you came here." You might have heard of him. Of course, the man had heard of him, Frank Howard. And I said, I'd like to present this book to you, Sonny, or, you know, this young, to this young man and gave him the copy of the book that I would have given to Frank Howard. Hmm. I gave it to the kid who was more deserving. Interesting. So, Great story. Yeah. And that story is in the, is in the book. I mean, I just can't, it's just one of, one of the highlights of the, uh, of being around Frank Howard. And then um, he gave a, uh, a panel with Rick Dempsey and the late George Michael, not the singer, but the, the sportscaster who's, who, if, you, if you're familiar with the DC area, you know who George Michael is, the yep. sports machine mm-hmm. uh, for many years. And George Michael, just an incredible raconteur, knows everybody, you know, loves everybody in sports. And these three guys talked and we're just like 60 or 70 of us old timers sitting in there, like completely yeah. in rapture. Right. Frank Howard is talking about things like he's describing things that I'd never heard before in, in baseball. He talks about Swifties. Swifties is a fastball. I can handle those Swifties, but you throw those UFOs and I can't catch up with those. UFO is a curveball. And he said, that, that Sam McDowell would throw me those UFOs. <laughs> I'd swing and miss. And anyway, just a delightful guy. Rick Dempsey, of course, was the, 
1983 World Series MVP for the Orioles. And uh, it was just a great, great uh, panel discussion. And uh, that was just a very memorable time. That was 15 years ago now. Nice. That's a great story. Uh, Getting back to the book here, what were some of the differences that you face putting together a book of stats compared to some of the other books that you've written? Well, it must have been a different process, right? It was a completely different process because most of the book was about compiling the stats. So I was spending day after day after day, six, eight hours a day, looking at these score sheets and compiling. I don't use computers. I compile them one by one, game at a time. And I uh, basically would take, you know, player A, whatever his name is, and I would look, okay, let's say it's uh, Eddie Yost from the Senators, okay? Eddie Yost played third base for the Senators uh, 1957 and in the 50s. And I'd look and go, well, let's see, Eddie Yost went uh, one for three with a walk and a stolen base. So I would, uh, I'd go into my, uh, my spreadsheet on my laptop, or on, yeah, and I'd, uh, my word processor document, Word, and I'd, I'd type in the number three under AB, one under H, you know, zero, zero, zero for extra base hits, uh, stolen base, one out of one because he stole a base in one attempt. And, uh, you know, your batting average there is 333. And then the next game, you know, you just compiled game after game after game after game. I did that for 7,000 games plus. Mm -hmm. And uh, that took a bulk of the time. But while I was doing that, I kept seeing there was a story here to write. Look at all these stats. I mean, the stats are just numbers, which is the cover of the book is the 198. Uh, I don't know if you can see it here. The 198 Chicago Cubs as they were compiled as they played with my game 80s baseball. So there they are. And, um, you know, one by one, game after game after game, I would compile the stats and – that's how it worked. So it was a, the process was much, much more different than looking at old newspapers or books or, you know, bibliographies or whatever to gather the information. Now, how did you decide in what order or how to organize this stat book? Like, what did you decide? OK, here's how I'm going to lay this book out. Well, I organized it chronologically because I thought it's best for me to start at the beginning of my we'll call it fandom for lack of a better word. Mm-hmm. And so I took the early days of, uh, you know, being a fan and what I was thinking. And I, I discuss how I learned about the game and then how it, you know, melted into the concept of playing the Catico all-star baseball game. Mm-hmm. Shout out to the late Ethan Allen, who was a former player who designed that game. And, um, that's kind of how it started. I, I wanted to be chronological, but I wanted to create a full record of all of this information that I'd gathered for all of these years and it never really put it together. Mm-hmm. And uh, so it's, it's, you know, it's very encyclopedic, I think. Yeah. Uh, have you ever played any other sport besides baseball on the tabletop? I played some football and I played some basketball as I recall, I played the Vince Lombardi's game, which was the name of a very old football game. And I played the Sports Illustrated football game, both pro and college. Oh, hey, pay dirt I, and ball bound, right. That, pay dirt, right, pay dirt. And um, I forget the name of the college game, but it was ball a... Ball bound. Uh, right, ball bound. Wow, you're, <laughs> you're good, Ron. That's why he's uh, here. That's everybody. why he's here. <laughs> Ron's got it going on. You're right, ball bound. So I still have those those charts. And I was thinking the other day, you know, so the bull bound takes like the best season. Now this was made in like 1972 or something like that. They took the best college season of a particular school, like Ohio state, Michigan, you know, Washington, you know, et cetera, et cetera, Notre Dame, that kind of thing. And then they would make the 
the charts which were similar to the Sports Illustrated baseball in the color coding and the way it worked. Um, the dice were the, the 10 to 39 dice that Sports Illustrated used to great effect. And um, so I played, I played a, a bunch of games there. I played a bunch of uh, pro games as well. But I never really kept, you know, the, the st- well, I did keep the stats, but I, you know, ne- not that seriously. And then I, I think I played some, some tabletop basketball game and I forget what that was. Have you never ever, uh, hockey or anything else. Have, have you ever uh, written or thought about writing a book about something besides baseball? Well, I did write another book besides baseball. I have five books all together. Okay. Four are on baseball. <laughs> One was written during the pandemic called Gratitude. Okay. With a period. And it's basically short stories about my experiences around the globe and being in the Air Force and all the crazy things. How about another sport? How about another sport? I don't think I could write a book about another sport. I'm just, I'm not as invested in another sport. Mm -hmm. Okay. Okay. You know? And, and, and not to cast dispersions on football or basketball or hockey or any of the other sports. Soccer. Okay. All right. Let's um. Let, let's for a couple of minutes. Let's talk about your baseball game. All right. I want to talk about the okay. baseball game a little bit. All right. So the game is called Eighties Baseball. Right. Right. And uh, we we said that you can buy that right off the website. Is that is that what we talked about? Yeah. If you go to the website, right in the the left hand corner, do you have a share screen? Uh, Capability. I can probably call it up and share it. Yeah, hang on. You just pull it up right there. It's just pocopress.com. You you have it there. Uh, and I'll show you exactly how to order it. Um and, and what is what comes with the order. I really appreciate that, Dave. Okay. So here we are on the website. Yeah, here you are. So if you can can you blow that up a little bit? I might be able to. Let's if see. If you can. Use your uh, control uh, plus. How's that? Any better? Yeah. Okay. Okay. So in the very uh, far left corner there, there is it says 80s baseball seasons order form. Yeah. Click that. And then what you'll get is um, when you buy the game, the game is in PDF only and it's 20 bucks. It's 1995 and you get one season of your choice. So if you go over uh, to all of these, uh, seasons here you get all the teams from that particular season and then you hit the buy now button and then uh, i send that to you in a couple of different emails because i usually send the american league in one and then the national in another and um then i uh i'll I'll need to get your address so i can send you out the special the two ten-sided dice okay which uh, which the game needs to to run the game engine can you use regular and, regular ten sided dice, or is that regular ten sided dice? But the reason why I, I insist on sending them to you is that you need them to have different colors. That's really important in this game because mm-hmm. one dice is for the tens and one dice is for the ones. Okay. Right? So I, currently, I'm using a green and a white dice. So the green always are my tens. So if I roll a seven, that's 70. And then if I roll a one, that's 71. Each roll is absolutely identical to the next roll probability wise. Right, right. Once you see the charts, you can start to make some summations about what are the probabilities of this guy's, you know, talents as far as base running, as far as batting, batting average, power, et cetera, et cetera, pitching records and fielding and so on. And uh, you can start to see how the formulas, and they're just raw numbers. They're just simply raw integers. So uh, each particular page uh, displays the entire team. And then there's a bunch of other charts for the game engine itself. Okay. So the game itself is, uh, it's 1995 for the game. for the game, and then you get your choice of whatever season you want there. Okay. Now, the the website currently does not allow for you to order more than one season at a time. But if you order, let's say you, you like two seasons. Let's say you like the old-time game. You like the 1886. 
that first one up there and you want to get that 1908, yep. you want to get them both. <laughs> the PayPal that that is coded for the website will not allow for more than one. So you can order them one at a time and then I'll reimburse you for the, you know, for the fact that you had to pay twice for the dice, basically. Okay. I would say one set of dice, but then, you know, I'm going to, I'm going to rebate you the check back. Uh, now, now you said this is PDF only. I'm looking at four dollars yes. shipping. What is that now? Well, the, the shipping really. Uh, that's for the dice? the dice. Okay, that's yeah. for the dice. Okay. So when you make the order on on the PayPal, and this is all through PayPal here, um, you you would put in your address, and then that's how I know. Now, if if something um, <laughs> you ordered it. <laughs> and it did not show the the season. I think there's a maybe one click where it won't show the season. I would send you back an email and request that happened once where someone ordered and they didn't say what season they wanted. Okay. So okay, I just simply uh, asked them and then uh, I got it over to them. Now, how much there, are the individual seasons? If if I wanted to buy the game and then I said, okay, <laughs> send me uh, 1957, but I also want 1980. How much is an individual season? Well, like I said, the game is 1995 plus you get the season of your choice, so it's 1995. Okay, flat. Okay, and then if you want to get another season, you pay another 1995, and then I would, uh, and then of course you got to you got to tack on the four dollars for the shipping for the dice. I would then send you a check for four bucks. Okay, because you only need one set of dice. Right. Okay. All right. So that's the way it works. Is there a season that you haven't done that really intrigues you? Yes. <laughs> There's a lot of seasons that I go, oh, let me explain the seasons themselves. Right. Well, it's called 80s baseball because it was designed in 1984, beginning in 1984, and it has all of the seasons from the 1980s. So there were 260 separate teams in 1980, mm-hmm. uh, 26 per per season. There were there was an, uh, a flop of uh, 14 in the uh, American League at that time and 12 in the National League. And then the National League eventually caught up to the current right. thing now. But um, so there's 26. That number uh, next to the uh, league there is the is the number of teams. So, but then I started to design um, other seasons. I think I started with 65 because I was really intrigued with Sandy Koufax, mm-hmm. and Harmon Killebrew, and, 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 and that kind of a matchup. So I created 65, and then I created 57 because, just because, just because I was born in 57, and I, I always wanted to know about, well, what was Mantle and Williams and uh, Colavita? What were they doing? Uh, they were doing a lot. They were doing a lot of damage to uh, the poor pitchers that they faced. Um, so I added in the 57 season. And then uh, as I kept adding seasons, I adjusted for errors and for roster sizes based on the actual stats. So, for example, for example, in 1886, there's a whole bunch of errors that are going to happen in the game because of the probability of errors was greatly increased back in those days. But you're not going to see very many home runs. In 1908, a lot of errors, not as much as 86. They had more rudimentary gloves in 1908, whereas from 86, they're still playing barehanded in 86. Right. right. And then, so uh, then, I, so I adjusted for the home runs and for the stolen bases. The style of play actually is built into the charts. When you get to play the games, you can see that um, you can adopt the style of play because it, it, it's right there. It's right there in front of you. So the adjustments are made for. Um, uh, for the particular season or the era. In the 1937 Negro Leagues uh, seasons, there's an adjustment there for the amount of games that were played and the uh, the types of uh, injuries that you can get. You don't get the, the the duration of injuries in games that you get for the for all the other seasons because they're you know more over 150 games or so 130 150 games. Okay. Mm-hmm. 
<clears throat> so there's adjustments for these. But to answer your question, that answer is 1961 because okay. that was the Mantle and Maris show right. uh, with all the home runs. The Yankees hit 240 home runs, which was you know, a world record at the time, since been obliterated by many teams since. Uh, but uh, I, I really – I plan to do a whole bunch more seasons. It just, it, you know, it, it, it doesn't happen overnight. It's just a lot of work to uh, create a, a, a team and a, and a league. So you get, so it's, an, it's a PDF, so you get the rules, and then you'll get the all, all the teams that are in that season. And, and so it's a team card, right? So all the players are on one page for each team. Is that how that works? Correct. Correct. Okay. And uh, is everybody quote carded is everybody that played in that season or did you have a cutoff for who, who played and who, who you're going to cut off but, um in in all of the 80s uh seasons there's 30 30 per team and and that's more than ample because um so basically the way it works is you get 18 uh position players and 12 pitchers and i even have a minor league type of a thing where there's 15 basic batters, position players, and then there's three guys that only can play, according to the rules, they can only play for injuries or in the late season call-ups. So, um, you know, in other words, there's a guy right now in 1957 Yankees named Jake Bella. Probably no one has ever heard of him because he just had a handful of games and at-bats. But he is in the, uh, you know, the reserve list, I call it, so he can only play when, you know, one of the other outfielders like Enos Slaughter or um, uh, um, let's see, Mickey Mantle or uh, Hank Bauer get hurt. You know, that's that's when he can come in. Okay. And then once they get back in action and I do my injuries by games rather than, you know, a disabled list or anything like that. Um, so it's games, one game, two games, five games, 20 games. And I have a 99 game injury where you get that and, you know, you're halfway through the season, you're wiped out for the season. So, and that, that has come into play a couple of times to, to interesting effect. These, the injuries are completely random. So like a Cal Ripken could miss a hundred games. He could, he could technically he could. Yes. Okay. Because, he, I mean, anybody can miss a, a bunch of sure. games. Injuries can be very freakish. Right. So, and many, many ball players over the years have been injured off the field doing ridiculous things. Really ridiculous things, like cutting themselves on, you know, cutting up meat in the kitchen. <laughs> Ruptured eardrum with a Q-tip. Seriously. What's that? Ruptured eardrum with a Q-tip. Yeah, wow. Q-tip in too far. I remember reading about that in the sporting news in the that, 80s. Oh. That is, that's insane. That's, that's too crazy. Bad. That's, thanks. All righty. So, again, uh, PocoPress.com is where you want to go to get the book uh, mm-hmm. or the game or both or everything there. Um, and, again, um, if you want to pick up the Spiders book, Misfits, Baseball's Worst Ever Team, I encourage you to check that out if you haven't. It's a fantastic history of the Cleveland Spiders and also 1899 baseball. I learned so much about baseball in 1899 with this game that I, I, have, I have more of appreciation for that era now, uh, you know, pre-1900 baseball, just by reading this book. And then the new book, The Big Monster Here, The Baseball Stats and Stories, Confessions of a Tabletop Simulation Gamer. So that's where you want to go. You want to go to uh, po- Poco Press. That's where you can find these books and also his new 80s baseball tabletop game. So we're interested, before, interested before to see what people think about up, that. Yep. Before you wrap up, obviously you're an Oriole fan. Peter Angelo's passed away today. You got yeah, thoughts on that one? Yeah. 94 years old. 94. Right. Next legacy? Or, you know, what's his legacy going to be for, for Baltimore? Well, uh, you know, I, I have people in my orbit that say that Angelos was just a jerk and, and completely that way because of what he did with the Washington franchise and, you know, always fighting against the franchise. Right. However, uh, and, and that's true. That's that's a valid criticism. 
um, especially being a Nationals fan, while I, you know, as as I have been, and a Washington Senators fan all my life. Right. But uh, that being said, Peter Angelos was one of the men who stood up against the strike and the the, the fact of, of bringing in 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 what was it twenty. 1995 when they were going to break the, break the union. Yeah. In the scrubs, he was against that. And, and I always thought he was one of the few owners that did that. And I always thought, yeah, that, that's a stand up guy. That, that, that's the way to go. You don't want to bring in these guys and water down the game. But unfortunately years later during COVID now I, I get it. There was, you know, problems with getting fans in the seats. But that particular season, when they put cardboard cutouts, that was it for me. I just I undid my fandom for the 2020 season. I thought this is so bush league, tacky, nonsensical. You know, don't do this. It's just right. stupid. You know, tell the story. It's real. There's not people here. Show the empty seats. We know it's a pandemic for yeah. crying out loud. Yeah. yeah. And uh, I just thought the cardboard cutouts were the last straw. But I came back the next year. And, um, you know, I'm still there, but I'm, you know, I'm still living in the past when it comes to a lot of these games. I do. I like the old seasons, and that's what I play, 70s and 80s. That's what I enjoy playing. And 1899 baseball from time to time, I enjoy playing as well. So, again, all right. So, again, uh, Jay Thomas, Hedrick, hey, thank you so, so much for coming back thank on you. the show and talking yeah. about your new book here and talking some baseball with us. And uh, yeah, congratulations on the on the baseball game, eighties baseball. And again, you want to head over yeah. to uh, uh, Press dot com and check that out. Uh, pick up the oh, game. Can I say one more thing about the game. Okay, sure. Yeah, I want to say that um, we're trying to build with this game a special type of an audience, like that Strad has, that Appa has, that some of the others OOTP have. Um, and I have a Facebook page called Eighties Baseball where I am documenting on a every other, every third day basis of what's going on in my 1957 replay. Oh, nice. And okay. I'm inviting everybody that plays the game to post there to say how their particular replay or their seasons are going and, you know, talk about your game, a specific game or a particular, you know, series of games or whatever you want. Just ask that you say what season you're talking about first in that sure. first sentence. And if you go right now to it, uh, you can go to it now, Dave, if you, if you want. I'll, I'll just give you a sample of it, how it works. All just right. go to Facebook if you can. Is it 80s spelled out E-I? Yes, it's spelled out 80s with the, the spelled out, 80s baseball. And Kurt Berglund has done your game on his channel, too, Correct. if you want to see a, a, a sample of how it's played. So. Correct. Alrighty, I am going to. And and Steve Etzel has also done one okay. as well. All right, so that's where okay. we are, right? All right. If we go now to this first entry here, if you scroll here and then and then build that up, uh, uh, you know, pull that up. Yeah, there you go. All right. So I'll just I'll just read it real quick. Well, I can't I can't see it that quick. I can't see it that small. The Baltimore Orioles earned a split of the four-game series in Fenway against the Red Sox. The 1957 American League replay is full of surprises. Boston third baseman Frank Malzone committed four errors. My goodness. And you think it was Butch Hobson. <laughs> in a game won by the Red Sox four to three, Baltimore held down the mighty bats of the Red Sox, allowing only a 188 series batting average. Ted Williams continued his slump with only four hits in his last 25 at-bats. Teddy Ballgame's average now sits at a very paltry 382 for the campaign. <laughs> so if you go down, so then I have a graphic, and then, you know, this is the one with Nellie Fox. Right. And and the great work that the Chicago team is doing. They're, they're four games behind the Yankees. And then uh, you got, you know, you got Ted Williams there and Malzone uh, together. And I, well, there's Musil. I don't know who the other guy is. Um, and then you, you yeah, so uh, standing. Yeah. That, that's uh, that would be um, 80s baseball. Yeah, okay. Ashburn, Rich, Richie Ashburn is the oh, other guy in the Phillies uniform there. Nice. So, so anyway, so I'm inviting people to you know on a grassroots level to talk about their games uh, and and post there, and uh, you know people can get kind of a community spirit going there. 
Fantastic. Nice. All righty. All right, so there you have it, folks. So get over there, get the game, and post the results over there on his Facebook page, and let's take a look at uh, how everyone's doing. And I'm interested to see uh, what seasons people are playing, too. That's the other thing. I want to see Man, what nice I do. I want to see. Uh, I, know, I know the orders that I've got so far, and it, it, it's it's completely varied. Really? Sure. Interesting. People that have ordered are just ordering all, all the different seasons. I think there's 21 or 22 different seasons, all told. All right, that's fantastic. All right, so Ron, let's wrap this up here. So you've been Absolutely. listening to the Digital to Dice podcast with Jay Thomas Hetrick talking about his new book, Baseball Stats and Stories, and also his new baseball game, 80s Baseball. Ways to get a hold of us, digitaltodice.com. Our text line is 978-751-DICE. And the best way to get a hold of us by email is digitaltodice at yahoo.com. And again, if you're on Facebook, join our Facebook group, facebook.com slash groups slash digital to dice. Uh, thank again. Thank you for coming on and talking thank some you. baseball. Thank you. Thank you both. Ron right. and Dave. Thank you. All right. Ron again. Thanks for joining yeah. us here. As always. All right. And we'll talk to yeah. everybody later. Good night, Gary. Gary, Indiana, right? Gary, Indiana. my home sweet home. <laughs> okay. All right. Just, just confirm. You're too funny. <laughs> You're too funny, man.